Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Graham Phillips back with us. I'll tell you a little bit about Graham. Also, this book, Strange Fate, an extraordinary true story of paranormal discovery, he wrote with Jody Russell, who lives in the Los Angeles area. Graham lives in the United Kingdom. He's been one of Britain's best-selling nonfiction authors for 40 years, has published 20 books concerning historical mysteries. They include investigations into the death of Alexander the Great, The Secret Life of William Shakespeare, The Mystery of King Arthur. His book also covers his search for historical relics as the Holy Grail. He's considered a real-life Indiana Jones. Graham, welcome back. It's been a couple years. Hi, George. Yes, it has, but uh, I'm still alive and still going. Good for you. And how's Jody doing? What do we hear about her? She's fine, but I, I'm not sure if she's listening to this. She might be asleep, but she's in Los Angeles, so hopefully she's awake and listening. And it's not too late. It's only a little after midnight, so she might be up. Hi, Jody. Cool. wherever you might be. <laughs> hey, Graham, tell us a little bit about Strange Fate. Tell us about this investigation. Well, it's a little bit different to my other historical investigations. It started off as an historical investigation into a secret society that existed in the mid-19th century based in central England, they claimed to have found in an old burial mound in central England, they claimed to have found this small stone um, that was shaped in the shape of a heart. They called it the heart of the rose. And they believed that it had extraordinary supernatural powers specifically the power to alter fate, time, even to cross into different universes. Now, they wrote about this in the mid-Victorian period, way before things like the multiverse became popular. So I, I thought it was fascinating that they even claimed to have done this sort of stuff. But in the end, Jody and I decided to go in search of this stone that this strange group called the me and I a group had claimed to have hidden. This group, what does the, the, the name mean, me and I Well, it's an anagram for I am one. They believed that different cultures throughout the world had different ways of, uh, different forms of mysticism, like in China, India, the ancient United Kingdom, and elsewhere. And they believed that they were all different ways of looking at the same thing. So it was firstly an anagram for I am one, but it was also the name of an ancient land in what is now Turkey uh, that they believed the stone was originally made over 3,000 years ago. Now, you were looking for, as you mentioned, the heart of the rose. What is that lost relic? Well, it hadn't been, I hadn't found any reference to it before. As you mentioned in your introduction, I've researched things like the Holy Grail and gone in search of that, investigating all yeah. sorts of uh, different uh, references in history to it. But there wasn't really any other references to this Heart of the Rose other than what this me and I group wrote about it. But they claimed, for example, that. In 1851, on, on May the 4th specifically, that one of the daughters of the, one of the people involved in this, a girl called Mary Heath, um, w- went into an old burial mound in central England at a place called the Bridestones. Uh, it was uh, around about 1,500 years old, which, historically speaking, dates from the kind of period that King Arthur is said to have lived. She entered this tomb while an archaeological dig was going on there and somehow managed to find this small stone, the heart of the rose. When she came out, 
she said that she had felt impelled to dig in a certain place, and there she found it. And afterwards, she became psychic, is the only way to describe it. She had all sorts of strange abilities. She started telling her parents and others in this group that there, all sorts of things about themselves that they couldn't have known. And she eventually proved herself by taking them to an old ruined church on the uh, not far from where this burial mound was and she said that if you dig down here this part of the ruins you'll find a stone slab and underneath it is an old crypt containing old documents belonging to the knights templars from the middle ages all sealed in lead containers and she was right i mean five or six of these people all wrote separate accounts of how this happened. So they'd been led to find some ancient uh, hundreds of year old manuscripts and a, a lost crypt by a seven year old girl, which is absolutely astonishing. Incredible research. Is this stuff similar to like Stonehenge? The, 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 the burial mound is like similar to Stonehenge, yes. Um, Right next to it, it's about 1,500 years old, it is thought to have contained one of the last druids of Britain, the old priesthood of the Celts before the Anglo-Saxons invaded. And it was thought to have been a woman who was the inspiration behind the Arthurian legend of Morgan Le Fay, the the uh, wizardess, if you like, of the Arthurian legend, or Morgana, as she's sometimes called. So she was supposed to be buried seemingly with this stone that gave her remarkable powers that this little girl found. Um, but right next to it, there was a stone circle that was even older, about the age of Stonehenge, and something similar to Stonehenge. There's an area called Bidolf Grange, where this group met back in the 1800s, you write. What's so strange about this place? Well, once they found this stone and this little girl had led them to all these ancient manuscripts and seen the talismans that had belonged to the Knights Templar group in the Middle Ages, um, they started this me and I group based at Bidolf Grange, an old Victorian mansion. Well, it wasn't old then, it was just built then. Right. And it was on the grounds or in the estate of this Bidolf Grange that this burial mound had been, and also this old uh, ecclesiastical building where they discovered this crypt. What they started to do then was practice various ancient forms of mysticism. They built a mock, uh, a, a reconstructed, Egyptian tomb on the estate. They built a Chinese sanctuary like a pagoda and a pool and other uh, ancient Chinese mystical sites. They built a Celtic glen, as they called it, which was basically what the British, ancient Britons used to uh, worship at, which was like a sacred spring uh, coming out of the rocks, a pool and also standing stones, some of which they actually moved from right next to the bride stones, this tomb nearby. So they built these, and they also built an underground Roman temple right under the house. And it was here that they met and performed whatever strange ceremonies or whatever other mystical practices they did in the belief that they could alter fate or even, in some cases, believe that they could travel through time or to other worlds. While your investigation was underway, Graham, didn't weird things start happening to you too? Well, yeah, at first I was just regarding this as an historical investigation into a bunch of people with rather weird beliefs. I did think that there must have been something pretty weird going on just beyond historical, if you like, and more mystical, especially so because so many witnesses claimed that this young girl was able to perform uh, amazing feats of prophecy or whatever you'd want to call it. But um, we were, when Jody and I visited the, the, where the tomb was, it's just a load of old stones that remain now where this little girl, Mary Heath, her name was, had found this stone. Um, we went there, and suddenly, it was a nice sunny day, suddenly the rain started pouring down, there was thunder, lightning, far more violent weather than you'd normally get in England, 
And the, but there was a massive cloud directly over us that seemed to have come from nowhere, where all around us, it was completely clear. And the, the thunderstorm Weird. seemed to be directly overhead. And while we were there, we, we, we filmed the, the, what was going on while we were there uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a, a phone camera. And what seemed to be a kind of ball of light seemed to shoot from these stones and into the nearby bushes. Now, people said it could be lens flare or something, but experts had examined it, so they couldn't really explain it. But it might have been something to do with the electrical storm. One way or the other, the storm lasted for about five minutes and was only present when we were there at the stones and, and no one else in the area around. That's pretty dramatic, isn't it? Do you think you stumbled into some kind of like parallel universe? Well, at the time, we just thought we'd just stumbled into some rather strange um, weather phenomenon. But shortly after this, we began to find out that things were rather different to how we remembered them. For a start, uh, Biddulph Grange, the Victorian house nearby where all this, um, these people had met, was um, but it, there was a fire there that we, as far as we know, the research that we'd carried out, Jody and I, a fire that had taken place in 1897. We'd written all about this and we'd done all the research about it. It was still in, in the books that I'd written referring to it. But suddenly we went back to the Grange house itself, which is now open to the public, and one of the, we were just di discussing the, the history of the place with one of the guides who suddenly told us that this fire had taken place in 1896. And we said, oh, no, 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 it's 1897, because you'll see it there on um, uh, one of the pictures that you've got showing the Grange as it used to be. But no, it had changed. And that was just the first of a whole series of small little incidents that could be down to faulty memory. But as these strange changes in dates and reality carried on, we had to think we were into, in some other kind of world. For example, there was one person we'd been talking to a few days before who didn't even remember us. That's weird. Now, are there any members of this group through Offspring still alive today? Well, this is what we're still trying to find out. I mean, we've been investigating this for a good couple of years. I mean, on and off, I've been looking into this group for about 40 years. It's only now I've gotten to write the book about it. But um, we, the, the, the last of the, these people were called the Heath family that lived at Biddulph Grange and ran the whole thing. Mary Heath, a little girl, ran it for a while when she, when she was an adult. Her sister-in-law, a person called Laura Heath, took over. She died in 1897, and after that, the group seems to have broken up. Um, there were offspring, but these people didn't seem to know very much about it. We found one family who had old documents written by the Me and I group that were kind of hidden away up in their attic. They really didn't understand the significance of them and had no idea of what their ancestors had been doing. So we're still looking for people today who may still today be carrying on whatever this group were doing. Were they like uh, strange people in, that, in those days? I mean, were they violent at all, do you know? No, not, not in the slightest. The interesting thing is uh, most of them were women. They came from rich families uh, that lived in stately homes throughout Britain, they, they, who then travelled to Bidolf Grange for these meetings. They included a number of female pre-Raphaelite artists. They were mainly women, as I say, female pre-Raphaelite artists, writers, and also people who were pacifists, and specifically a lot of women who were into the uh, early, uh, early sort of years of feminism, they, they were some of the people that were involved in um, campaigning for votes for women, women's rights generally, at a time when that was extremely unpopular. And from the few writings we have got from this group, it seems that they wanted to try and add mysticism to their intentions of changing the world to some degree so that women got a far better lot. 
they were known as the first wave feminists. And a lot of the ones who started the Votes for Women campaigns, both in America and this country, and other women's rights groups, were also members of this mystical me and I group who seem to be trying to use the paranormal, if you like, or the supernatural to change the world in favor of more equality for women. So opposite of being violent. Graham, when Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland, was he somehow stumbling into this too? Yes, he did. It was uh, quite interesting because just a few months after this little girl, Mary Heath, discovered this stone and pretty much started the whole thing off when she'd found these, uh, this, this old crypt. That's when the group started. A few months later, in the summer of 1851, her father and mother went to stay at a, a nearby other stately home um, belonging to a man called Lord Halifax, who was a member of the British government. He was an extraordinarily wealthy man. Mary's father, Robert, was into mining, uh, coal mining and uh, iron production. He was staying with Lord Halifax as, uh, as um, ongoing meetings and discussions about mining rights on the Halifax estate. So Robert and Anne, his wife, went with them, and so did little Mary, uh, the oldest child, and who was just seven at the time, went and stayed with them at this house. Interestingly, at exactly that time, Lewis Carroll was the tutor to the children of Lord Halifax. And it was at that point that he first came up with the ideas in tandem for both of the Alice books, Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, and it wasn't until many years later that the story was published, but he always claimed he had based his story in 1851 on a real little girl who, according to the books, is exactly seven and a half years old. Now, some people have suggested that he based it on one of the children, the girls of Lord Halifax, but none of them were that age. But Mary Heath, who was staying there, who was probably also, for a, for a short while, tutored by Lewis Carroll was that exact age. She was staying there. She just recently, remember, crawled into a hole in the ground into a tomb. She'd come out saying she'd been to a fantastic land where all sorts of strange things had happened. Jeez. They put that down to imagination. And this may be where was, he was inspired to write the story of Alice in Wonderland. That's fascinating. Might they been, this group, stumbling into time travel? Well, the time travel bit is quite weird. Um, that they claimed that they could see through time. They didn't. The, the, unfortunately, the evidence we've got is rather fragmentary in documentation. But what happened on one occasion? Jody and I went into the mock Egyptian tomb that I was telling you about, into a central dank, cold chamber that's there. And in there, there's the figure of a, a statue they put of an ancient Egyptian god called Arne, also known as the Ape of Thoth. It's like a, a human-sized baboon creature who was supposed to be the Lord of Time. And in that particular chamber, Jody was uh, filming me, just talking about it for a YouTube thing I was doing. And uh, when the film came out, on it, you can see quite clearly it's dark, but if you, you can see that there's a, a figure seemingly of a Victorian lady standing there looking at me as I walk past. And a couple of weeks before that, Jodie had had this vision. She does meditation quite often, and sometimes she does get um, experiences of things that, are, are, you know, that, are, that prove to be accurate that she couldn't have known about, and she had dreamt of this actual event taking place, and she'd seen me, in the future to her, standing next to this woman, exactly like, like it appeared on this film, a woman in Victorian clothes, who was seemingly was able to see me because she turned and looked at me as she went past. So it appears that uh, there was both past, present, and future colliding in one place, and that's just one example. Graham, was it the group you were investigating or the locations that were creating this strange thing, or both of them together? Well, it's difficult to say. 
the locations were certainly something to do with it. I mean, I mentioned earlier about these four shrines that were created on this estate, this beautiful garden estate uh, that surrounds Bedolf Grange. And I mentioned one of the things that had happened in the Egyptian tomb, but what uh, also in the uh, Chinese garden, the Chinese sanctuary, which consists of a, like a pagoda shrine and also uh, a pool and uh, a little bridge going across the pool, typical Chinese um, temple, if you like. While we were there, and this is not just us, I'll I'll tell you about other people who have had things happen to them there. There was not so long ago on the BBC in the UK, there was a TV series about these magnificent gardens around Bidolf Grange, and they were reconstructing or repairing parts of it. And while they were repairing the Chinese area of the gardens, people suddenly started hearing, the people who were working there, started hearing whispering voices as if the when the wind blew through the the willow trees that hung down over the pool uh, there was like whispering and at first it was just put it down to imagination but people actually said that they heard the voices of people talking about things that had happened to them as if they were picking up if you like, psychic messages. Mm. But none of these people had been psychic before, as far as they knew. Another thing that happened, at least four people that I've witnessed, I've um, interviewed personally, claimed to see, like, Victorian people in Victorian clothes walking around through, through the area. They thought at first that there must have been some sort of pageant on or Renaissance fair or something like this, yeah. only to find out there was nobody in those kind of clothes around at all. Like they came through a time warp or something. Well, yeah, more. It, it's not so much ghosts in your traditional sense, haunting of people uh, performing the same actions over again and only being seen, say, by mediums and the occasional lucky person. Just ordinary people were able to see things, hear things. On one particular occasion, Jody and I and a number of people that belong to the organization that, um, that now owns Bidolf Grange in the area around it, building experts, were looking at the old Egyptian tomb, the, the, the recreation tomb, and they were banging on the walls and came to the conclusion that behind one of the walls there may have been another room that at some point in the past was sealed up. But while they were doing this, knocking on the wall, knocking came back as if from the other side. We checked out the area and found that there probably was a room there and it had been filled up, filled in with rubble over the years because maybe it was unsafe. But when one of the people, was, people who was knocking knocked, they sort of said, hello? And there was this woman's voice clearly saying, hello, back. And that we got captured on film. So um, obviously there was nobody locked in there, but were we communicating through somebody and to somebody in the past? I don't know. It certainly seemed that way. What clues did you pick up from old paintings, and how was that relevant? Well, throughout the whole research in the last couple of years, we've been searching for this um, the, this item, this this relic called the Heart of the Rose, this small stone carved into the shape of a heart that they the little girl had found in this tomb. How big was it? And uh, how old was it? How how big was it? Oh, well, it was about uh, two inches high, about two inches wide. Okay, about it's small, pretty inches. small. Pretty small. Other, another one of these stone hearts had been found by archaeologists in another tomb not far away. But they're rare, and it seems to be something that was uh, specific to this area um, around 1,500 years ago that people were buried with these things. But everything seemed to have started when they found it. The group itself claimed that the stone heart gave them some sort of mystical powers, although... It seemed to have been the power source, if you like, behind everything that was going on. And when the group split up in the late 19th century, they hid this and they left a series of clues. Now, these were in paintings 
uh, one particular painting by a woman called um, Evelyn de Morgan, who was a relatively famous painter around 1900. And in this painting, she showed an hourglass, and below it, a rose. Remember, this thing was called the heart of the rose. And a, a book lying on the floor. Um, and the person in the painting that she'd painted, the, the sitter for the paintings, the model, was a person called Jane Morris, who was also a pre-Raphaelite painter, but also a high-up member of this group, the Order of Meaniah. So it seemed, and we, we believed that it was her who had eventually hidden this stone, and so at her feet was this hourglass, this rose, a book, and the cover of the book, uh, the name on it uh, was in Latin, and it basically meant um, portal to eternity. Hmm. Portal to eternity was the name of another painting by one of this group, and it showed a, um, a cave that was said to, and, 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 and it showed an angel standing there, next to Sir Gawain, one of Arthur's knights. Now, not far, I mean, well, it was a little bit more complicated than this, but cutting a long story short, we realized that not far from Bidolf Grange, in the hillsides of an area called the Peak District in the northern Midlands of England, there was a cave where the story of Sir Gawain in the Arthurian stories is set where he eventually... Um, meets a character called the Green Knight. He, uh, when he's there, he's shown a portal to another world by this angel. Well, because the painting we'd been led to showed this cave where this was supposed to have happened, which is on public land in, 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 in the north of, north of Bidolf Grange, we went there because we were sure this was where they'd hidden this heart of the rose. Was there anything supernatural about anything so far, Graham, that you stumbled across? Absolutely. I mean, remember you were talking earlier about Mary Heath perhaps inspiring the story of Alice in Wonderland. Wonderland, Well, she seems also to have inspired the story of Alice through the looking glass because when she was staying at Lord Halifax's estate in the summer of 1851 she became fascinated by this mirror that hung above the fireplace in the drawing room. And she claimed to she, she could see different um, strange beings in this mirror, just like Alice. She also claimed to have been able to go into the mirror into another world and return. Now, what was fascinating is that we managed to trace where this mirror ended up. And it ended up in a stately home, which is now a hotel and a spa resort in central England called Horcross Hall. And the mirror, somewhat refurbished, still stands above a fireplace in what they call the library, which is basically a lounge today where you can drink and and, and have afternoon tea, that sort of thing. And when we went to this mirror, which may have been the mirror that inspired uh, the story of Alice through the Looking Glass, we were absolutely shocked to find that the hotel staff said, oh, that mirror's haunted. People see this little Jeez. girl in the mirror, and she looks like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> I mean, they thought, they thought this was just a way of them interpreting perhaps how a little Victorian child would look. But on one occasion, um, we actually took a photograph of the mirror... And in it, you can actually see what appears to be the transparent image of a little girl with blonde hair, a a, a headband, and and the top of the bodice of a blue dress, just like Alice. Some people can see it in the picture, some people can't. It might be just a a coincidental arrangement of features in in the picture. But so many people have claimed to have seen this little girl in the mirror and also walking around... Um, various parts of the building. One one person woke up in the night in the room, the hotel room, directly above where this little girl um, has been seen, and claimed to have woke up in the night and seen her floating directly above them, looking oh, down. Oh, jeez. That would and they be weird. called that room the Alice, the Lady Alice Suite. Um, so you've got Alice in Wonderland, maybe Mary Heath, haunting a mirror 
looking like a little seven-year-old, even though she didn't die until she was in her late 20s. So we began to suspect that possibly, I mean, one of the things that the Me and I group did was they believed that they could project themselves as something called a tulpa, a kind of thought form mm -hmm. double of yourself, into mirrors. It's a practice that takes place still today in Shinto in Japan. Right. And had this little girl been able to project herself into this mirror, we're still investigating that one, and we've got psychic investigation teams onto it. Now, you've had some strange people pop up from appears nowhere, give you some information, then they disappear. What's that all about? Well, I'll give you one example. There's this strange little old man um, in dark clothes, black suit, a kind of scruffy black suit, um, that um, appeared... We, on one occasion, we were um, at, looking at a, an exhibit uh, that the me, and, uh, the me and I group, one of the artifacts that they had ended up in a museum in a place called uh, Upton upon Seven, in, again, central England, in a museum there. And um, we were looking at it, and we, we didn't know too much about the background to it. And suddenly, oh, we were talking to the custodians, the people that have, who, who run the place, and suddenly this little old man seemed to appear from nowhere. He must have been in another gallery, and started telling us a few things about this that we just didn't know before. So I wanted to ask him more. He went into another gallery. I followed him in there, and he'd gone. And there seemed to be no way that he could have gone, got out of that other room. But what's weirder, a few weeks later... We were in a completely different place, another old manor house, examining one of these paintings that I was just talking about, when um, he suddenly appeared behind us. There he was. he was. He started explaining things about the painting and basically led us to start to realize that there was clues in this painting to lead us to the heart of the rose stone. And... Um, he then just, I asked him another question, what do you know about the group, me and I are? And he just turned around, left, there was a load of people in there being shown around by a guide, and he got lost in the crowd. I followed him through, had to push my way through a number of people, got into this other room, he'd gone again, and nobody else seemed to have Jeez. seen him. Jody and I saw him, there was one other person who saw him, so he was definitely there. He wasn't in my imagination. And he was physical, he right? Went. He was he was a real being. You could touch him? He was a, he, I could, well, I didn't actually touch him, but he looked like you could touch him. He wasn't transparent. He spoke to us. He answered questions when we asked him. So, But you could, the we, interesting thing is he was in dark clothes, but it could be from any date. He could be from now. He could have been in Victorian clothes. It was, you know, so was he a time traveler? Hmm. Was he some sort of thought form like little Mary Heath put there to help guide us? It, it's just weird. And he's just one of the examples I could give of people like that who turned up and helped us. At any point, Graham, were you scared? Was uh, Jody scared of this area? No, not at all, because nothing happened that f to, to freak us out. Most of the weird things that happened, we didn't realize they were weird until afterwards. Um, and the other thing was, there was nothing ever threatening about it. I think we were quite worried. You didn't we feel were, like you were in any danger or anything like that? Not at all. Not in the slightest. I mean, that doesn't really make it sound very exciting. But um, <laughs> there was a, a few occasions when, as I say, these strange thunderstorms happened, and we could have been um, hit by lightning. But sure. We kind of felt all the way through, if, if we're being guided by these strange people who appeared from nowhere and uh, by fate and strange circumstances, then perhaps it wanted us to be on this quest to discover this heart of the rose. So, no, we never really felt threatened at all. Did you ever find the heart of the rose? Yes, we did. Um, ultimately, in this cave that I was talking about before, um, we went there and... By the time we got there, there were all sorts of strange universe shifts that have never shifted back again. So you're probably speaking to me from a slightly different universe. I don't know. That's right. Um, but there was this uh, public house, this pub, this inn near where this, uh, th this cave was, 
that was called, I mean, we'd been researching, we'd been looking into it because we thought some of the people involved in the thing had lived there. Um, and it was called the mermaid. We'd even got photographs of the, you know, old photographs of the sign, the mermaid. When I say old, just a couple of years old. When we got there, it was now called the old oak, not the mermaid. And the people there said it had always been called the old oak. So, I mean, we were saying, that was, how? Does this has happen unless we're in a different universe? But if we're in a different universe, how come... Half the people we spoke to did remember it being called the mermaid, and another lot of people said, no, it's always been the old oak. So did we drag other people with us? I mean, or was this some kind of weird patchwork reality? Anyway, so we were right kind of confused, if not afraid, when we got to this cave. And when we were there, suddenly this... We we didn't know where we were going to find this uh, stone, where it could have been hidden... Um, and in this cavern, there was a kind of great big hole in the roof where maybe the, the cavern had collapsed at some time in the distant past. You were leading up, Graham, to how you found the heart of the rose. How did that happen? Well, we were in this cave. <clears throat> Above uh, the central kind of cavern bit, there was a kind of gaping big hole in the roof, around which on top of uh, where the cave was, there was vegetation, bushes, that sort of thing, and trees. Suddenly, not shortly after, not, not long after we got there, a storm took place, not dissimilar to the one that had taken place when we started the whole thing at the Bridestones burial mound, burial area. Uh, suddenly, this storm suddenly started. The rain was pouring in. But what was even weirder, we, we don't get tornadoes in this country, not very often. And it seemed that we were in the middle of like a whirlwind because hmm. there was all these branches and leaves and things being blown around at high velocity above us through in, in, the, in the air above this hole in the roof. Um, and the rain was pouring down so hard that within a few moments, there was water rushing down the walls of the cave. And there was this niche in the wall in the cave, this uh, little recess, and the water was pouring down there, almost like a little waterfall, like a cascade. The lightning was flashing, and then suddenly what, what we both saw, what seemed to be, and it may have been created by shadows of trees and rocks caused by the lightning, but a figure seemed to be standing behind this cascade, this waterfall, that looked for all the world like a, a, a human figure with wings, like an angel. Now, remember in this painting that had led us there, there'd been an angel depicted in the picture, and it was supposed to represent Morgan Le Fay from the Arthurian legends, who, mm. remember, was the character, the person in history who is thought to have been behind the, the individual who was buried in the tomb where the heart of the rose had been found. I mean, were we seeing her? Was this just a coincidence? But whatever was happening, the moment we saw this figure, the rain stopped, the wind dropped, and um, it was all calm again. It wasn't long before this cascade of water um, uh, ceased. And on the floor, right next to where we were, we saw this small stone heart, pink in color. It turned out to be rose quartz, um, about two inches wide and two inches high, and uh, it was just lying on the floor. It seemed to have been washed down by the waters Amazing. from a crevice higher up in the cave at exactly the time we were there. And it was as if, I mean, we thought for a moment, well, could this have been something left there by some New Age people as a kind of offering because the cave was considered sacred in that area? Or, but the, the fact that we found something exactly like what we were looking for that had been washed down by a seemingly coincidental storm just at that time was too much. We really realized that we had somehow been led to and given the heart of the rose. The big question is why? Well, this is, I, I, this is what I don't really understand. Uh, we could have just, they could have just given it to us straight away, whatever it is. I mean, Jody and I began to refer to whatever was behind all this as the whatever. Because remember, the me and I group used lots of different forms of ancient mysticism, 
um, in, in the process of doing what they were doing. Mm. Celtic, Roman, ancient, Egyptian, and so forth. And so they kind of were, were they hedging their bets? The group called Me and I Am Means I Am One, was it one force doing all this? If it was, it had powers that are beyond belief. It could alter reality, seemingly shift time, make things happen, control the weather. I mean, I have no idea what this was, but we got the impression, the feeling, that whatever it was that was behind all this um, we, we led us through an adventure over a couple of years, that, that, a quest, if you like, that was as important, maybe, as finding the stone itself. Truly remarkable. Now, the, the, the stone itself, does it possess any properties, anything supernatural about the stone? Well, since well, since we've had it, nothing's actually... We, with the date we gained it, um, when this all happened in this cave, was the 13th of October last year, which just so happened to be the 150th anniversary of the death of Mary Heath, the little girl who found it. That can't be coincidental. And it happened at exactly sundown, which also seems strange. Um, but nothing has happened to it. At, at the moment, it's... Um, you're like this. Where is it now? It's in Los Angeles. It's being examined by uh, geologists at a university who are trying to determine exactly how old it is and where it was made, the kind of rocky... What, what's from. your guess, Graham? How old do you think it is? If it's what the Me and I group said, it could be around 3,000 years old oh, oh and my made gosh. in what is now modern Turkey. Um, it certainly was hidden in that cave, in the uh, tomb for a hundred and for one thousand five hundred years. Were there so, many of them so, yeah. made? Well, there's one other one that I know about that was discovered in another nearby tomb that was in a museum close by in a place called Leek, um, but it's since disappeared. We went there, we interviewed the. Uh, curator, and they don't know what happened to it. So there is another one out there somewhere. What's been happening to us, Jody and I, over the last couple of years, the, the universe we live in isn't as simple and straightforward as it appears to be. There's a lot these days in, uh, in the media and TV and movies about multiverses and different realities, and it seems that maybe such a thing does exist, and the veil between these different realities... It isn't that thick. You know, it's a thin veil, and sometimes one can seep into the other. And times can change. Um, you know, uh, things can actually uh, co communicate over time. Did the story, the strange story, end by finding the heart of the rose? Was that the end of the story, or did something else happen? No, <laughs> it didn't, because we had a little break, and then... Um, we both, Jody and I, both started getting dreams. I mean, Jody was seeing like uh, she, she was finding herself in a place, for example, uh, that she recognised, and suddenly features in that landscape would change subtly, and she thought she was maybe seeing different versions of, a, of, of the of the universe, a slightly different universe. I started having the same things. And uh, your lady just now was saying about people appearing at the end of her bed. I was having very lucid dreams about this little Alice girl appearing at the end of my bed. But she never actually said anything. But the next day after that appeared, um, unusual things would happen that set us off on a quest that was still continuing at the moment in search of another ancient artifact that people may have heard of, more than the heart of the rose, anyway, and that was Pandora's box. That's right. Do you ever come across any ghost stories, Graham? Yes, I years ago um, in 1979, I used to be the editor of a magazine called Strange Phenomena, uh -huh. which investigated all sorts of paranormal events, and. Um, Probably because we had lots of different psychics and mediums come to the offices of the magazine, um, it may have stirred something up. It was an old Victorian house, 
and um, lights began fusing when, when there was no account for, you know, nothing to account for it. A strange smoke seemed to appear throughout the place regularly on a daily basis that could never be accounted for. There was no burning or anything. And uh, people started seeing um, apparitions, if you like, but not just apparitions from, like, the past, like Victorian figures, but also people in contemporary clothes. Again, that may have been some kind of universe um, merger or something, but what happened to me on one occasion, I was actually walking along a corridor, I was alone in the building, and suddenly a heavy box of magazines came flying past me and crashing into a door. And shortly after that, I saw what could only be described as a, um, a woman in, like, Egyptian clothing. Well, she didn't actually she didn't have any clothes on at all, which is rather embarrassing, but she had an Egyptian headdress on and the kind of eye makeup they used to wear in those days from their paintings. And me and three other people all saw it together. So, yeah, that was some sort of... Well, what's an Egyptian lady doing in a Victorian house in I'm Central sure. England? Reality isn't as we really think it is. It's almost as, as if we're living in some sort of matrix, although that was, I don't believe that there's some kind of future robots that have us in tanks or something, but that reality itself is more of a kind of construct that can be altered. Um, and I think maybe the reason that certain people are being given um, visions or things happen to them, paranormal events happen, is a kind of big overall picture of something or some others that us may be more advanced than us or in a slightly different kind of reality, are trying to teach us something about ourselves and trying to say, look, the world can be changed. It doesn't have to end in at a kind of disaster, whether that be ecological or of our own make, uh, ecological disaster or whatever it happens to be, that you can change the world. And each, and, and I've met so many people over the years who have had the same kind of experiences that I've had, not perhaps in the same sort of way, because Jody and I were looking for a specific artifact and investigating a particular mystery. But if they kind of start to think about things, they may say, wait, hold on, that, I always thought that was there, but it's changed. I always thought that person did that, but now they did something else. Um, and they hadn't really thought about it. So I think these things may be happening to a lot of people, um, but they're not just, they just don't recognize it. And the way that these different, shall we say, entities appear to us may be controlled, changed, altered by our own perception. I mean, I was investigating Alice in Wonderland, so I see Alice in Wonderland. Somebody else may be investigating UFOs, and they may see grey figures with large eyes, if you get what I mean. Absolutely. Do you have any experience in entities that have attached themselves to people? Unfortunately, um, or should I say fortunately, I haven't. I mean, I'm, I have never investigated anything like that myself. Um, I've never, I've heard of cases of possession and strange things like that, but I have no direct experience of it. All I can say is that what Jody and I have been, have been investigating for the last couple of years um, is completely benign. There's nothing negative about it. Nobody got hurt. It, it may be something completely different. I, I just don't know. That just sounds awful. It is, truly. A lot of times you put your guard down, these entities can get to you. And uh, I've heard that time and time again from some people. I suppose so. I mean, some people may remember um, a man called John Keel, who wrote uh, quite yes. widely about weird paranormal events uh, many years ago. Um, he wrote the uh, the original story, The Mothman Prophecies. That's right. He had similar things happen to him that we've had happen to us, but a lot of the things that happened to him were, were, were quite negative. Um, so maybe there are different things. I mean... The universe obviously isn't just benign. I mean, the world isn't just benign. People aren't just benign. Maybe, you know, maybe that's how the whole thing works. I don't know, personally. Let's go to Joe in Monterey, California. Hey, Joe, go ahead. 
Thank you for taking my call, George. You're welcome. This is right down your alley. <laughs> yes, several alleys. Uh, benign world? Yes, it's a challenge. Um, what about, about time travel? Okay, and just travel in general. Many uh, practitioners, and these were practitioners, heavy-duty practitioners, and they work in vortexes, which is uh, like a veil between two worlds. So they got the benefit of two energies. What they do, or shall I say, what a person who travels, they create a talisman of protection because you can't think of everything when you're traveling. And they need something of a power device. And a talisman is very good for traveling, actually, or just time traveling, or just traveling. What I see, and I think you might understand a little bit more about when you didn't realize that that individual was not uh, not kosher, put it that way. He might have had a talisman, and he might have also practiced invisibility. There's a few things that you do practice, and invisibility is always good. It's, it's, it's not dangerous for, for the individual. It doesn't harm anyone. You don't do harm. Talismans are talismans of protection. So Anytime that people don't understand, why didn't I realize what was going on? They might have had an energy field around them that makes people not think about certain things. People can block psychics mentally by putting up a, a, a guard. But when they travel, when these uh, magicians travel, they do a lot more than just put up an energy field. Well, Joe, what do you recommend poor Frankie do to keep this entity off her back, literally? Well, you know, um, it's good to have someone who knows what they're doing, like an exorcist. Uh, there's shamans that do the work. There's people locally that might understand how to get rid of entities. Entities, you can call on help, angels. You have guides and angels. You can if you practice te telepathic communication. It's not that difficult. A strong intention uh, would, uh, designed to gather uh, help from the astral plane, from, ast uh, from angels or archangels. Uh, some people, uh, they carry objects like stones of protection. But sometimes stones can also be a, a, a communication device. They can be very powerful. I'd be careful with the stones as a communication device because it's like a loudspeaker on the astral plane and you don't want to bring attention too much attention to yourself I like the idea of the exorcist uh, Graham your stone the heart of the rose that is being it's still investigated what kind of medicinal powers does it have anything we haven't actually I haven't come across any records concerning it being used for healing the person who is meant to have made it, um, a woman called Omphali, who was a, a legendary queen of the land of Nehaniah uh, in the early Greek world, that this was on the coast of what's now Turkey. Um, she was said uh, in Greek mythology to have created a number of stones, some of them heart-shaped, others uh, diamond-shaped, squares, pyramids, that were meant to have different properties, and some of them were meant to be healing power, uh, have healing powers. One of the most famous stones she made, which is much larger than the one we have, was, called, was known as the Oracle Stone, which is now on public display at uh, the ruins of Delphi in Greece, which was where the Delphic Oracle, a woman, would sit near the stone and could uh, predict future events and give people um, readings, if you like, that uh, kings, princes, and warriors would go to for advice in ancient Greece. So there seem to be different stones for different things. Ours, if you want to call it ours now, the heart of the rose, seems to be more to do with it, it, it controlling fate, if you like, or altering the path of, um, the, the, uh, the, I don't know, the, the fate and circumstances that it had some kind of control over, which is why we put, called the book Strange Fate. There was something that happened to Jody and I, which was maybe somewhat similar. We went to, a, to look at an old building, 
Uh, I won't go into the whole details, it's not really important. Went to look at our old building, the, the groundskeeper of the area showed us round, it was unoccupied, we filmed there. When, after we'd gone to this uh, burial mound, the Bridestones, and weird shift seemed to happen in the universe we went back he was the character i mentioned who didn't even remember us we said that uh, we kind of like p- p- fall back on it and sort of didn't push the point and said can you take us to this house and he took us there again this time the whole thing was boarded up it had metal plates over all the windows the screws were rusted it had clearly been there for ages and he said uh, well, well no one's been in there for years and Uh, We said, well, you took us round. No, no, no. We even got film of the inside. When we showed it to him, he basically kind of said, and off he went. Um, So it seems maybe what the gentleman just described is some kind of view into a a different world, different universe. I don't know. How old was the Mianaya group, in your opinion, Graham? Well, the, the, the group that started that we were investigating was in 1851. But the reason why they call, originally started calling themselves the Order of Me and I is that had been an earlier group that met in the, in, in the late 1500s, early 1600s, at the same place. They, they actually, their leader, a woman called Mary Bidolf, lived in a, man, a manor that stood on the same site as Bidolf Grange did. And it was, it was them who got hold of all this Knights Templar stuff that they hid in this crypt that little Mary found in 1851, which kind of restarted. They kind of wanted to carry on doing some of the things that this earlier group called the Order of Nehemiah had done. So in which case it may be a group that keeps refounding every so often, like you've got the 1600s, you've got the mid-19th century, maybe the Knights Templars, maybe the woman who created the stone in the first place back in ancient Greece. Um, So it's difficult to tell. It it may be that fate or some sort of um, cycle of something or other wants to keep the thing going every time the world may be in a a bit of a crisis. I don't know. Good luck with the book, Strange Fate. Where do you get it? Uh, On Amazon, on Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk. Super, thanks. Graham Phillips, uh, his uh, website is loaded with all the information he's done. Check it out. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.